So this is MathStat 341, Lecture 20. What we're going to do today is we're going to do mock-ups inequality, Chebyshev's inequality. We will talk a little bit about uh, applications of these. We'll do multiple proofs of these. We'll talk about why you can expect certain methods to do a better job than others. So there's a whole slew of different kinds of bounds and inequalities you can get. A lot of what we're going to be doing today is trying to get a sense of well, what kind of result do you expect to have a chance of proving and what might be useful. So, so Markov's inequality. I don't want to start off by giving it to you. I want to just say x is a random variable and the expected value of x is finite. And that's all I'm going to give you. And so the question becomes, if this is all you have, what can you do to try to estimate or bound the probability that x is greater than or equal to some number a? And the more general the setup, the harder it's going to be to have a useful result. Because your result has to hold in every case. All I've told you is x is a random variable. That's not a lot of information. Okay. Can anybody give me any bounds for this probability? Yes, yeah, between zero and one. Okay. Why? Because it's a probability. All probabilities are between zero and one. If I gave you a bound that this was at most three, is that correct? Is it useful? No. So what we will see with Markov and Chebyshev is sometimes they will give you bounds that just aren't that useful. Okay, And then depending on how you calculate things, you will get different bounds depending on what information you use. Um, I will take a baseball example at random. Uh, in game four, the Red Sox were down by four runs after six innings. What is the probability that the Sox come back? Well, it really depends on how you calculate it. If you look at how the Dodgers have done this past year, they were 54-0 in games when they had a four-run lead at any point. So the probability is zero. Well, but they hadn't played the Red Sox before, and this 54 also includes a lot of teams that were weak. So there might be a reason why they're down by four runs. There was a very long game the night before which depleted bullpens. Your iPad is having seizures. I know. Yeah, it's just the iPad was up late last night. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long few days for the iPad. Let's try and see if that does a better job. Thank you. So depending on how much information you use, you might get different calculations. Do we use the fact that the previous game was very long, it was 18 innings, and so they don't have the same bullpen as they normally do? The more information you input, the more confidence you have that you get a good bound. If all I'm giving you is the mean, that's not much. What other piece of information would you love to have? The variance. And that's what Chebyshev will do. Chebyshev will add in the variance. All right. So, for now, let's do special case. What do you think might be the easiest value of the mean to assume? You can leave it on. What might be the easiest value of the mean to take? Zero. Zero. And let's take maybe A equals two. And I want to try to estimate what is the probability that it's at least two. And all I know is that the mean is zero. So we know that the answer is going to be between zero and one. <coughs> Let's try to look at different x's and see if we can get all numbers between zero and one. If we can, then this means that this setup is too general to be useful. Can somebody give me a random variable with the probability that it's at least two is zero? So yes. Ah, but the mean has to be zero. Okay, so x is uniform on minus one, one. That has mean zero, so mu equals zero, good, and then the probability that x is greater than or equal to two is zero. So we have no hope of getting a lower bound for this probability. It could be as low as zero. Could it be as high as 1? Do you think it could be 100%? Mm. 
Okay, why not? Because the mean wouldn't be zero. Yeah, the mean is zero. So if you have a 100% probability of being two or higher, I don't see how you're going to get a mean of zero. Could it be 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
of what Markov's inequality might be. That if I want to keep the mean where it is, the best I can do in terms of lowering things is put all the remaining probability at zero. And to minimize the contribution here, put all of it at the very lowest possible value. So if I want to talk about being greater than or equal to four, assume I have 25% at four. That's the best I can do. So now we're getting non-trivial results. Now we are getting upper bounds. Is it possible that the probability could be zero at four? Yeah. So give me an example where you will have zero probability at four. It's always one. Yeah, it's always one. So your, your go-to generic simple example is just have all the probability at the mean. So if all the probability is at the mean, then this could be zero from this point onward. So a bound of 25% might actually be too large. We don't know what the truth is. We just know that 25% is an upper bound. It might be zero. And so this suggests Markov's inequality. So Markov's inequality. So x greater than or equal to zero is a random variable. Expected value of x equal to u is finite. And then the probability that x is greater than or equal to a is going to be less than or equal to the expected value of x divided by a. So if you look at this, if a is less than the expected value of x, what kind of probability will this be? So if a is less than mu, then the expected value of x over a, what kind of number is that? What well, can you tell me about its size? It's greater than one. Yeah, it's greater than one. It's useless, right? If you ask, what is the probability that I'm at most a half and my mean is two? We have no useful bounds. Why? Because what we could do is we could have something very big and positive, right? Here's zero, here's your mean, here's your number over here, A. I could now put, you know, 99.9999% of my probability here and put a very small percent over here so that the mean is going to be mu. I can get any probability I want. So before we had the problem of being able to go too far to the left, now we have the problem of going too far to the right. We do not expect Markov's inequality to provide any useful information if A is less than the expected value. However, once A is greater than the expected value, this becomes useful. So what you need to think about this is, this is a inequality, but you only want to use the inequality if A is greater than mu. Otherwise, it is useless. Someday in the future, you may have children, and you may have driveways that need to be shoveled. When the kids are very young, it is not clear if it is a help to have the kids shoveling the driveway with you. At some wonderful point, they become a net positive, and the kids become useful. This is the way to view Markov's inequality. When they are too young, when they are too small, when they are too far below the mean, they are useless. They are like having little kids shoveling for you. And you will be spending more time dealing with the kids fighting or actually shoveling snow onto the driveway from the driveway. Okay? But at some wonderful point, it becomes useful. And that's what we're going to do today. So the question now is how do we prove this? Okay, so proof. Well, for a lot of these problems, you start with the definition. So the probability that x is greater than equal to a is the integral from 0 to well, sorry, from x goes from a to infinity of the density function dx. Right? We all agree that that is the probability. Okay. Now, 
This, I want to compare this to the integral x goes from a to infinity of x over a f x dx. So which is larger, the first integral or the second integral? Tell me about the ratio x over a. It's increasing, and it's always at least 1. Because I'm integrating not x from 0, so this is clearly going to be less than or equal to. So the question is, why would I do this? Well, I have an expected value of x. So recall the expected value of x is the integral from 0 to infinity of x f x of x dx. We should have that in the background. And so because we know what the mean is, I want to somehow, well, I've got this mean coming in as my bound. I want to get the mean into the problem. I have the integral of f of x. I want x times f of x. So I'm going to multiply by x. Well, I can't just multiply by x, but if I multiply by x over a, then everything is fine because x is at least a. Well, the mean I'm supposed to integrate from 0 to infinity. Can I extend the integral down to 0? What happens if I now make the integral go from x goes from 0 to infinity? Which integral? Yes. Can you just subtract from 0 to a with the integral? If I wanted to have an exact answer, yes. But I'm not trying to do exact answers. I'm trying to do bounds. How does this integral compare to this integral? It's small. x over a is positive. f of x is positive, and this is a non-negative. It's a probability distribution. So I can do this. I'm just extending my range of integration. Now I can pull out a 1 over a, and I have the integral x goes from 0 to infinity of the density function times x dx, and that's just going to be the expected value of x over a, and that finishes the proof. So there's a lot of good ideas in this proof. So the question becomes, where would things break down if x could take on negative values? So everything works nicely here. What could go wrong? So it was very important that every time I went from here to here to here to here, my integrals never got smaller. If x could take on negative values, then if I go to negative values over here, oh, that's going to be a negative number. And then going from here to here, it's not necessarily going to be a greater than or equal to. So it's this step over here that needs x to be greater than or equal to 0. If you can have negative values of x, the integral could actually get smaller when you go through. You always want to go through the proofs and try to see what's the key moment. Where do I need to use the assumptions? Why can't I do this in more general settings? Any questions on Markov's inequality? So we're going to use Markov's inequality to prove Chebyshev's inequality, and then we might also prove Chebyshev's inequality directly. Chebyshev is an extremely prolific mathematician. If you look at how his name is translated from Russian into English, there are probably over 40 acceptable ways to translate his name. I have been trying to advocate that people spell his name differently depending on which theorem you want to refer to. So when you say, by Chebyshev's theorem, if you spell it, oh, that, you mean the one from probability, oh, you mean the one from number theory, oh, you mean very influential person. And what's nice is you get to see sometimes people develop tools because they want to apply them to something else. They're not just doing these things in isolation. So Chebyshev's inequality. And there's a good chance we'll see how to use this in some of the research I've done with students later in the semester. So now we have x is a random variable. The expected value of x equals mu is finite. And the variance of x equals sigma squared is finite. 
So now we get the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma is less than or equal to 1 over k squared, or the probability that x minus mu is less than or equal to k sigma is greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over k squared. Both are good formulations. What I like about Chebyshev's inequality is everything is being done the correct way. If I want to talk about what's the probability AX takes on a certain value, what's the one value that you always associate to a probability distribution? If you can only give me one number. So what one number do you always associate to a probability distribution? It's expected value. So I'm talking about what's the probability I'm a given distance away from my expected value. That's a great question to ask. Then the next question is, well, what scale should I use? If I want to measure you know, how much money people have, it matters if I'm talking about the people in this room or if there's a party at the Gates Mansion. You, know, you would use a different scale in those settings. If you feel that that is not the case, please see me after class. I, I'm happy to report that actually a former student of mine who took probability just got a billionaire to invest $100 million in their startup company. And I will be sharing more information about that and opportunities about that in the future. So I'm hoping for those of you who want the why should I care about this, the stuff he learned in classes like probability and operations research is the stuff that made him useful for the startup. And it's a very small startup. So this is the right scale to measure things. You measure things in terms of the standard deviation. The variance, if you're talking about heights, heights are in meters, height squared, that's the variance. Square root of that is meters again. So this is telling us, what's the probability you're at least k standard deviations away? And it drops off like 1 over k squared. This is not a great bound in general. And the reason the bound sucks <coughs> in general is because this is trying to work for every probability distribution with finite mean and finite variance. There's a lot of distributions like that. There's some of them that have a very slow decay, and there are others that have very rapid decay. Can anybody give me a distribution that has extremely rapid decay? So probability distribution that's decaying very rapidly at infinity. There are three natural candidates you can give me. One is any distribution with finite support, because then the probability will be zero. But what distributions have we seen that decay very rapidly? Exponential, but more important than exponential, the gold standard for this class. What distribution? Normal. You know, these decay extremely rapidly. These bounds suck for the normal. They're not even close to the truth. And the reason why they're not great is because they have to work for every distribution. All right, so what, now, what we've done so far is we've stated Chebyshev's inequality, and we've explained why this is the right kind of inequality to shoot for. We're looking at a random variable about its mean, and we're measuring things in terms of numbers of standard deviations. So here's proof one. Mathematicians are lazy, okay? So when a mathematician is lazy, whenever possible, you reduce it to a previously solved problem. Anybody know what inequality we might be able to use <laughs> to attack this? Uh, yeah, Markov's inequality, right? Now, we need a non-negative random variable associated to x. Does anybody know a non-negative random variable associated to x that somehow involves either the mean or the variance? So I want some new variable y that's going to be related to x. And it's going to be non-negative. So what do you think I need to do? How can I make something non-negative? Yes. Square it. Square it. But maybe I want to do something before I square it. What should I do before I square it? Uh, Center it. Subtract off the mean. Now, what's the expected value of y? The expected value of y is also known as the variance of x. And by Markov, 
we know the probability that y is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of y divided by a. So all we have to do now is decide what we want a to be. So we've got the probability that x minus mu squared is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to sigma squared over a. Ah, well, we don't want to have a square here. We want to have a square. So this is the same as the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to the square root of a less than or equal to sigma squared over a. I'm just interpreting x minus mu squared greater than or equal to a is the same as x minus mu is greater than or equal to square root of a. Okay? So we want this to be k sigma. So we want, that, that's what we have over here. So we need the square root of a equals k sigma, or a is k squared sigma squared. And then we get the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma is less equal to 1 over k squared. And that finishes the proof. I will assume that we're never going to be taking k to be a negative number. All right. Your k will always be positive for us. What values of k is this useless? Yes. Yeah. We know the standard deviation is at least sigma. So if we ask, what's the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to something less than the standard deviation, we can get no useful information. You could have all the probability being at plus and minus sigma. So you could actually have zero probability that you're inside. Or you could play those games now with high you know, values at the extremes but with very low probabilities. So if you take k to be less than or equal to 1, you get a bound of it's at most 100%. Completely useless. Okay. Any questions on this proof? It's possible to prove it in the same way as we proved Markov. So what I'll do is I will give the Markov proof, essentially, again, it's a nice way to just really drive home, but I'll do it somewhat quickly. So this is proof two. Okay. So we want to calculate the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma. This would be the integral absolute value of x minus mu greater than or equal to k sigma of fx of x dx. That's just the probability. This is less than or equal to the integral x minus mu greater than or equal to k sigma of x minus mu over k sigma squared fx of x dx. Because since x minus mu in absolute value is at least as large as k sigma, this ratio here is at least 1. It's the same trick as the mark of inequality proof. Now I can draw up this condition here, and I only make the integral large. It's the integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity of x minus mu squared over k squared sigma squared fx of x dx. Oh, well, this part over here, that's just the variance, which is sigma squared. And so you'll just get sigma squared over k sigma squared. The sigma squareds cancel, and you just get the 1 over k squared. So essentially the same proof as the Markov proof. You multiply by a number that's at least 1, so you can't make the integral smaller. OK? All right. So what I want to do now is I want to try to give you some understanding or some sense of why some results are better than others. Which do you think is going to do a better job, Markov or Shevishev? Chebyshev, why? Um, because it uses the variance. 
Ah, so, so Chevy Shog is better than Markov because it uses more information, and the hope is that if you're using more information, you should do better. That's one point for Chevy Shog. What advantage does Markov have over Chevy Shog? I'm sorry? You don't need the variance, and there are some distributions that don't have a variance. I could give you uh, 1 over 1 plus absolute value of x cubed. <coughs> if you put in a normalization constant, this is a probability distribution. It has a mean, but it doesn't have a variance. And so Markov is more applicable than Chebyshev. But when they both exist, Chebyshev will almost always do better. So what I want to do is I want to just try to really drive home this point with one of my favorite examples. It's calculating square roots of numbers. So there's two methods. There's divide and conquer. So let's say you want to solve f of x equals 0. And maybe I have f of x is x squared minus 3. So I'm going to be looking for the square root of 3. Can somebody give me two integers that sandwich the square root of 3? Zero and three. Give me this slightly better. Uh, one, and two. one and two. Square root of three lives somewhere between one and two. I take the midpoint, 1.5, and I check and see. So over here, f of one is going to be a negative number. At two, it's going to be a positive number. Because my function is continuous by the intermediate value theorem, it has to have a 0 between 1 and 2. So I now check at 1.5. And when I check at 1.5, okay, I get that's 3 halves. That's going to be 9 fourths minus 3. I'm going to get a negative number. I'm going to get negative a third, I think. So I now know there must be a root between 1.5 and 2. And so I now go halfway between. 1.75. And when you plug in 1.75, it's going to be positive. So you know there's a root between 1.5 and 1.75. So for divide and conquer, every two iterations halves your uncertainty. 2 to the 10 is 1024 is approximately 1,000. So what this means is 10 iterations gives you three decimal digits. All right. So if you wanted to get the square root of three to six decimal places, you might have to do this about 20 times. Okay. It's a nice method, and it doesn't really need that much. It just needs continuity. Uses continuity, and that's it. So the next method is Newton's method. This is the problem that converted me from I'm torn between math and physics to, oh, it's math. How many of you have seen Newton's method? Right. This is one of the most powerful methods we have. It is phenomenal how fast it works. Now, whenever you hear the word Newton, what do you immediately think of? Isaac. Isaac is correct. Uh, what type of math do you think of? I said math. That's why I'm trying to eliminate physics. What kind of math do you think of when you hear Newton? Calculus. Calculus, right? So we're going to use more than continuity. It's going to be continuity plus differentiability. And the idea is to use the tangent line. So imagine you have um, some function like this. And you want to find a 0. And you have some initial guess over here. What you do is you construct the tangent line to the curve at this point. And you see where does the tangent line hit the x-axis. And that will give you an approximation to the root. If the tangent line was perfect, it would be the root. And then, because it's not, you do the shampoo instructions. So what are the shampoo instructions? Lather, rinse, repeat. So you just keep iterating. So now we come up here. Or maybe the hotels I go to have fancy shampoos. And then you draw a new tangent line. And you can already, by the time I draw it twice, it's really good. So imagine we have some point xn here. This is going to be f of xn. The slope is f prime of xn. 
So we then get um, y minus f of xn is f prime at xn times x minus xn. If you want to find the intercept, what is the value of y at the intercept? Zero. So we would get negative f of xn would be f prime of xn, xn plus 1 minus xn. So we get xn plus 1 is going to be negative f of xn divided by f prime of xn, and I add in the xn to the other side. This is a really nice formula. It tells me this is where I am, this is how much I move, and this is where I end up. It's very easy to iterate this. And if we take, for example, f of x equals x squared minus 3, when the dust settles, you get xn plus 1 is 1 half xn plus 3 over xn. If instead of having minus 3, I had minus 5, I would have a 5 here. And notice that if xn happened to be the square root of 3, you would have root 3 plus root 3 divided by 2. Oh, good. It's stable. So if you start at the square root, you stay at the square root. So I'm going to just do a few of the approximations. I've calculated them out. What's nice is if you start with a rational number, all of your guesses will be rational. So I will start off with my first guess is 2. It gives me my next guess is 7 fourths. My next guess is 90. 7 over 56. My next guess is it's a little bit big. 18, 817 over 10, 864. And the last one is 708, 158, 977 over 408, 855. Looks like a phone number. 776. All right, one digit. How accurate are these? Right. The first one is 1.75. Right, so the square root of 3 is 1.732050075688 That's not bad. Let's do the next one. The next one is 1.73214. Oh, they shifted up by one. That's, that's, oh, did I? Oh, that's sorry. The next one sorry, thank you. Um, yes. 2.00, which is not great. All right. But 1.75, one iteration is not bad. And two is not a great initial guess. 1.73214, not too bad. All right, next one. 1.732058101. That's not bad. If we do another one, it's 1.732058101. I might, I might be off. Um, right, this was first, second, 1.732.14 is third, 1.732.05.081. Okay, so then the next one is 1.732.05.08.075.688.77193. So, you can see how far. You basically double the number of digits of accuracy every time you iterate this. I could write x4, but I can't really see the difference anymore. So with four iterations, to have this many digits of accuracy is beyond phenomenal. Okay? I'm trying to excite you about mathematics and pure mathematics at times. At least smile. Make me feel happy. Okay? This is incredible, to get this much accuracy this fast with simple algebra. It's incredibly powerful. There's a lot of great mathematics lurking in the background. Why does Newton's method beat the shit out of divide and conquer in this problem? You've got to use strong language. Why does Newton's method do so much better? 
What does Newton's method use that divide and conquer doesn't? It uses slope. It uses calculus. It uses differentiability and not just continuity. Not every function is differentiable. Most problems in mathematics can actually be converted into problems like this, where you're trying to find a zero of a function. So being able to do this is extremely valuable. All right. Any questions on Newton's method? All right. So again, it's not surprising that the more information we use, the better we do. There are times when we have to use divide and conquer because we do not have differentiability. But when we have it, it's wonderful to use. So what I want to do is I want to do a quick test of Chebyshev. And I'm going to test it by looking at a distribution we haven't studied before, but it's at least close to something we've studied. I'm curious to see how many of the stats people have seen this. The Laplace distribution. How many of you have seen the Laplace distribution? All right. So the density function is 1 half e to the negative absolute value of x. So this is a Laplace distribution with a parameter of 1. It's essentially a double, it's a two-sided exponential. I'm just reflecting it. And if I had just on the positive side, I wouldn't have the 1 half, because it's going both on the positive and the negative side, I just have the 1 half. Can somebody give me the expected value? Zero. Why is the expected value zero? Because it's symmetric. It's symmetric. And so now, the variance of x is going to just be the expected value of x squared, which will be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x squared 1 half e to the negative absolute value of x. Well, I can double this and go from just 0 to infinity because of this is an even function. So that'll cancel. So I have just x squared e to the minus x dx. And so anybody know what that is? This is basically the second moment of the exponential. I just want to make sure I do not create a typo. And so when the dust settles, it's 2. There are several ways you can do this. You could actually do integration by parts. You'd have to do it twice, not too bad. You could also put in a parameter lambda and do differentiating identities. All right, so we now have that it has a mean of 0, a variance of 2. So let's say I want to calculate the probability that x minus its mean is greater than or equal to 7 square roots of 2. And now we can see why I'm choosing 7 square roots of 2, because square root of 2 is the standard deviation. So by Chevy Chef, what is this going to be? Is this then 1 over 49? 1 over 49. Anybody know approximately how big 1 over 49 is? Yeah, it's about 0.02. Because this is essentially 1 50th. 1 50th is 2 hundredths. So the actual answer is approximately 0.02048. Are you surprised that it's a little bit larger than 0.02? No, because we're dividing by 49 and not by 50. All right? The answer, though, the actual answer is the integral from 7 root 2 to infinity of 1 half e to the minus x dx, and then just double it, because we have to go on both sides. Right? So if we can compute that integral, we're in great shape. All right, well, this is the same as the integral from 7 root 2 to infinity of e to the negative x dx. What function has to root of e to the negative x? Negative e to the negative x. So because it's negative e to the negative x, that switches the order of integration. Yes? Just clarify, each of 7 root 2, the, the works out nicely in the example. 
Uh, the, the root two is because I know the standard deviation is yeah. square root of two. <laughs> and I want to do over here, I want to have k times sigma. And you just chose k to be seven. I just chose k to be seven. Uh, in honor of the Red Sox winning a best of seven series. Let's continue the references. All right. So this is just going to be negative e to the minus x, so I switch the order of integration, e to negative x, evaluated at infinity, and seven to the root of two. I'd evaluate here that infinity is not so bad. So this is going to just be to the negative 7 to the root of 2. So do you think this is close or not close to the point 02048? Yes. Probably really bad. Really bad. Why? Exponential. Yeah, exponential is decaying very rapidly. So because it's decaying very rapidly, I'm not expecting a good approximation. And my expectations were met. 0 0.00, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, 2. That's off by a lot. You know, Chevy Schiff says happens at most 2% of the time. Well, it's actually a little bit less. It's 0.005% of the time. You are off by a tremendous amount. If you do the standard normal, what's the probability that x minus 0 is greater than or equal to 10? By Shervishev, what do you get? 1 over 100, which is 1%. Right. Anybody know the answer off the top of their head? Yeah. Basically, if you just say zero, that's essentially yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how many digits? So you get from Chebyshev that it's at most 1%. The actual value is about 10 to the negative 23. So I just really want to drive home that a lot of times you don't need to be that clever. Crude bounds suffice. <coughs> but other times, we're going to need a lot more. Missing by over 20 orders of magnitude, I'm going to have to take off for that. Okay, That's a little bit too far from the truth. So this is going to inspire us to prove things like the central limit theorem and to have better ways to estimate what these probabilities should be. All right, this is a good place to stop.